Hey guys, at this point, I hope that you have finished Circe's and you guys are going to be starting to work on your final paper, which is due on May 11th. If you're having difficulty deciding what topics to use, I've listed for you a lot of resources and a ton of topics that I would love to read papers on um, within your Moodle file last week. So definitely check those things out um, and look over the new rubric that I'll be using for this paper. Because I think that the Circe's Mud Poems are perhaps the most difficult of the source material that I've provided you guys, I'm going to spend my lecture today breaking down what some of these poems mean, particularly focusing on, number one, truthfulness of the narrator, which is something that you have to question when you're looking at a retelling. It's a lot of times the purpose for the retelling, as we can see here in this example of Circe's. We also um, are going to look at how the recreation makes sense and how Atwood changes the character to be somebody who's perhaps a little bit more likable or at least someone that we want to spend more pages with. If you haven't yet read the Circe's Mud Poems, I highly recommend them. They're beautiful pieces of work from acclaimed author Margaret Atwood, who's also created um, the Penelopod, which is a retelling of Penelope's side of the story, and also she's most known for The Handmaiden's Tale. Um, so in the section Circe's Mud Poem from the collection You Are Happy, Margaret Atwood reworks an episode of the Odyssey, and this is the period during which Odysseus arrives and resides on the island of Aiea, home of the sorceress Circe's. Some of the Circe's Mud Poems are, are characterized by deep tragic irony, where the individual is so isolated as to feel his existence a living death. Other poems are, clo are closer um, to compliant. They're poems that talk about exile and neglect and protest and cruelty, which we know that Madeline Miller uses in her version and her portrayal of the sorcerer Circe's as well. Circe's, as a dramatist persona, is an isolated being. She's forced to live and relive forever her fate of femme fatale. The section includes, for the first time in Atwood's repertoire, several prose poems that allow Atwood to comment with more precision on the conflicting truths authored by, offered by reality and myth. In the Odyssey, Circe's episode is narrated by Odysseus. In this circumstance, the Homeric hero is a narrator with extensive authority. He is, after all, a protagonist who is the sole survivor of the events that he's narrating. The truthfulness of the narrative act is fully bestowed on his trustability and is not possible for anyone to disavow his story as previously stated, he is the only person who lived. The suspect that the original narration may be unreliable is due in large part to an element that is already present in the text. Homer describes Odyssey as a genius of cunning and deceit, a hero who does not hesitate to resort to lies, both with his friends and with his enemies. If he often lies, then even the plot of his adventures that he narrates in first person can be unreliable. The possibility and the necessity of a new narration then derives to some extent from an aspect inherent in the original story. In the poetic section, Circe's Mud Poem, we apparently meet a new characterization of the dread goddess of human speech, which can be seen as an example of what Alicia R. Stryker calls revisionist myth-making. The poet deconstructs a prior myth and constructs a new one, which includes, instead of excluding, herself, initially satisfying the thirst of the single poet, but also ultimately making cultural change possible. You might note that this sounds familiar, and it's because it's similar to what Mad Madeline Miller did in her prose work. The new characterization, however, is at best fluctuating, 
The poetic text is not firm in denying the traditional story, nor in affirming the innovative version of the mythic character. In certain instances, this happens because the innovation is simply denied, while in others, the innovative elements originally originate intensifying secondary features that are already present in the Odyssey. I'm going to look at two poems as exemplifications of this technique. Here's the first. It's titled, It Was Not My Fault. It was not my fault, these animals who were once lovers. It was not my fault, the snouts and hooves, the tongues thickened and roughed, the mouths grown over with teeth and fur. I did not add the shaggy rugs, the tusked mask. They happened. I did not say anything. I sat and watched. They happened because I did not say anything. It was not my fault, these animals who could no longer touch me through the rinds of their hardened skin, these animals dying of thirst because they could not speak, these drying skeletons that have crashed and bitter the ground under the cliffs, these wrecked words. This poem contains Circe's attempts to defend herself from the accusation of being responsible for what occurred to the travelers that reached their, her island, their metamorphosis into pigs, that is. If, Cer if Circe is simply revealed not to be responsible for these transformations, the hippotext would be proven false. In the first two stanzas, we notice the repetition of, it was not my fault. Circe affirms her innocence because the transformation occurred without her intermission. The third stanza ends with the final assertion of her innocence and non-involvement in these acts because they happened. Following this, however, the poetic eye reveals more. The same expression is used again, adding new details. They happened because I did not say anything. With the, use of, with the use of this, Circe's story is complete. The woman observed the transformations, which she had probably triggered, without intervening, almost with, cynic, with cynical gratification. Notice that this is what Madeline Miller did with um, Scalia in the novel, Circe's. In this poem, we see the first occurrence of the dialectic between traditional and mythic account and revised mythic account. Initially, the sorceress seemed to claim a new identity for herself, refusing her traditional role. However, she immediately takes a step back, and the new story that she was about to tell is negated by her feeble readmission of guilt. The fourth poem is a prose poem, and it's emblematic of the second mythopoetic technique. It reads like this. People come from all over to consult me, bringing their limbs which have unaccountably fallen off. They don't know why. My front porch is waist deep in hands, bringing their blood hoarded in pickle jars, bringing their fears about their hearts, which they either can or can't hear at night. They offer me their pain, hoping in return for a word, a word, any word for those they have assaulted daily with shovels, axes, electric saws, the silent ones, the ones they accused of being silent because they would not speak in the received language. I spend my days with my head pressed to the earth, to stones, to shrubs, collecting the few muted syllables left over. In the evening, I dispense them a letter at a time, trying to be fair to the clamoring suppliants who have built elaborate staircases across the level ground so they can approach me on their knees. Around me, everything is worn down, the grass, the roots, the soil. Nothing is left but the bared rock. Come away with me, he said. We will live on a deserted island. I said, I am a deserted island. It was not what he had in mind. The process of, alter the process of alteration of Circe's begins again denying tradition. The enchantress loses her traits of luring woman dedicated to the transmutation of her lovers into pigs and is presented instead as a cannibal female shaman.
Her new role is to collect the syllables of nature and to convert them into prophetic healing words. Because of her manic qualities, however, Circe's characterization is not completely new. Atwood Circe's is a prophecess, but this aspect is a secondary element that can already be found in the original version. Odysseus visits the underworld in order to hear Tiresias' prophecy. However, the prophecy concerning Odysseus Odysseus's further adventures is complemented by Circe's. Tiresias deals with the hero's fate on a large scale, while Circe's gives him precise nautical and geographic information and important advice about the notice that Odysseus and his men will have to undertake in order to go back home. Circe's detailed instructions then fill in the gap left by Tiresias. The original Circe's already displayed the precognitive abilities that Outwood exploits in her rewriting. The alternation between traditional and mythic account and revisionist mythic account is reflected in a dramatic shift in Circe's characterization. In some cases, she may be identified with the archetype that Joseph Campbell defines as woman as temptress. While in other cases, Circe aspires to identify herself with the opposite archetype, the goddess. The first archetype corresponds to a material and carnal gratification associated with lower passions, temptation, and the distraction from the real goal of the hero. The second archetype corresponds to a higher level of satisfaction, which allows the hero to grow spiritually and to be complete as an individual. At times, Circe is, is described as a diabolical sorceress and tempstress. For instance, in the poem, The First, Witherings and Strung, where after various love promises following the Homeric source, she unsuccessfully tries to bewitch Odysseus into a pig. Or in the poem, Now It Is Winter, in other poems, Circe tries to be the goddess of the Homeric hero, but the consequence of this act is that she becomes victim to his violence. In the poem, I Made No Choice, a prostrated Circe offers Odysseus the things that he needs. Nevertheless, I gave you the food you demanded for the journey you said you planned, but is repaid with lies, but you planned no journey. In the poem, There Are So Many Things I Want, Circe abandons the conflict and crosses the imaginary boundary that separates her from Odysseus in order to share with him life on the island. It goes like this. There are so many things I want you to have. This is mine, this tree. I give, it, I give you its name. Here is food, white like roots, red growing in the marsh on the shore. I pronounce these names for you also. This is mine, this island. You can have the rocks, the plants that separate themselves flat over the thin soil. I renounce them. You can have this water, this flesh. I abdicate. I watch you. You claim without noticing it. You know how to take. Initially, there's an attempt to cross the barriers and overcome conflict for the benefit of an existence together. However, this becomes an act of submission. Circe resigns her claim to the land. It can be inferred from the choice of the verbs to renounce and to abdicate. This attitude will lead her to be a victim. As can be seen in the last triplet, where the verbs associated with a Homeric hero are connected with violence, to claim, and knowledge, to know. The beginning of the seventh line is also particularly relevant. Circe's words, this is mine, this island, echo the words pronounced by cannibals in the temptress, this island is mine. The parallelism between the two figures, both invaded on their island, make even more explicit the colonial metaphor.